when Lucas told me the theme was This Is Not a Man, he torpedoed two of the stories that I would have wanted to tell about manhood if the theme was a little bit less negative. And um, one of them concerned um, an adoption gone wrong in Reagan era Westchester. There was a couple at the country club. Um, the man was a, a chain smoker who wore a cowboy hat. And the woman wore um, uh, quasi-psychedelic moo-moos and had horn rim glasses. They were like the super saturation of the classic American couple. And um, as if by cosmic laws were um, incapable of having children. As if the American truth in its fullest form <laughs> knew to stop. <laughs> and they, um, they'd adopted an Inuit boy who came off of the plane with his head too small. And uh, in Westchester at that time, which was very much a triumph of people who had in the third generation made it out of the immigrant morass, uh, a mating orgy. Um, it was something to see him tearing across the pool in this country club past well-born daughters covered in coconut oil. And he would scream, watch me dive, watch me dive. And he would crash off the high board and um, emerge from the water. No one had paid attention. He wasn't there. And he'd generally forgotten a pack of Skittles in his swim trunks. And they'd be bleeding rainbow colors down his leg. There's a problem with this story, though, <laughs> which is what kind of asshole, even if assailing the people of Westchester, leads anyone to think that this wonderful Inuit boy is somehow less than a man. It doesn't play. You can't tell it. You have to move on. The other story that also doesn't work um, <laughs> involves my father and a terrorist. <laughs> my father grew up in a French-Canadian mill town that looked a little bit better than Beirut, but, except Beirut got a facelift, so a lot worse than Beirut. And um, he was French-Canadian. Um, and he went to work on Wall Street as a bond trader, which means that basically whatever the US government did from the time that he was about 25, he enthusiastically endorsed and fundraised for. And when I was in first grade, there was a girl in my class named Rosa Leviser. who was always very quiet, and she was adopted. And there were rumors on the playground about awful things her parents had done. And um, there was no Google then, so they remained just rumors. And I remember we had a party, a picnic, at the house I grew up in. My father had a garden in the back that he had built with some of his ill-gotten money. And um, he, I remember him clipping her a rose, and he said, you should have this, because your name is Rosa. A rose for Rosa. And um, she had very, you know, she was touched by this. And it was only years later that I realized that her father was a terrorist named Ray Luke Levisor, who um, had gone to Vietnam and had been a war protester, and then had been entrapped to selling a joint to a federal agent and had done time in prison, and had basically become convinced that America was rotten and that he had to protest it. Um, so he, there were a group of people who were bombing the lobbies of companies that did business with the apartheid regime in South Africa. And the government, even though there were members of the family who would have taken the girls, took them away anyway. So I grew up with this girl, but I only knew this years later. Another problem with this story, highly flawed story, very easy to conclude that your father's not a man. It's an ancient castration fantasy. And you're left endorsing terrorism, <laughs> which you don't want to do. So it's hard what I've been handed here. And um, for a while, it was less hard. I think in the 50s, you could just go mutilate elephants, wildlife, come back to New York, talk about it, say you'd learn something about manhood. For a while, there was war. And then video games took all the glory from war and then became war. Um, it's very hard. But I think that something remains, which is that to really tussle with manhood, you have to engage in a kind of death-laced right. Um, and I have a story about this. So this is a story that I decided that I could tell you without mocking the Inuit uh, or endorsing terrorism or coming off as a, a brat who hates his father. And it goes like this. It was beautiful spring in Park Slope, and mating was everywhere. There were babies in carriages all over Prospect Park. And I think I had some heightened awareness of the, um, 
of the, the need of a man to bring resources to a mating union because I got a call from a large magazine and they said, there is a supranational data billionaire who we want you to find and we will pay you $2.75 a word and we want 5,000 words about this man. And I'm not very good with math, but I got the $10,000 part pretty quickly. <laughs> and I was able to back into the 3,000 and then the extra 750 kind of followed and I thought, this could be a winner. <laughs> um, and I called my literary agent who is, I think, here tonight. And he said, do not take that piece. He didn't know and I didn't know that another writer had walked away from it. He didn't know and I didn't know that she'd walked away from it because she'd been declined permission or access to the person because the editor of the magazine had written in one of his letters that he should never be let back in America, <laughs> which is not a good way to get a guy in your magazine. Um, but, you know, what is a man if not a, a, a spreader of seed? And the baby carriages were everywhere. And um, so they kept calling, and, and I should have listened to my literary agent, but I didn't. And um, finally, so I, got a, I spoke to the editor at this magazine, and she said, you know, our culturally essential, wavy-haired, 60-something editor-in-chief is very eager to assign this article to you. And I said, that's fine, but I don't make these decisions without consulting my gnomish, lesbian, 60-something psychotherapist. <laughs> she said, great and totally understands. Go. So begins the odyssey. Uh, the session that day, I realized for the first time that in the waiting room, you look at a, a felt cutout of Noah's Ark. What is Noah but the original man, if you take the scriptures at their word? I mean, it was his sons who spawned us all. She'd been, well, her word rate was actually better than what I'd been offered because I think she'd said about 12 things over the course of 10 sessions. She was operating at Tom Wolfe, Condé Nast portfolio levels. And that day said nothing, but she had a, um, a caftan uh, pantsuit ensemble that was covered in Japanese, or sorry, in, in Chinese calligraphy. And I could tell that she was telling me by some sort of gnomish clairvoyance that I needed to take the article, that I needed to test my manhood against the manhood of the data mining supranational billionaire who did not want to be found, whose name was Eduardo Saverin, who lives in Singapore, which is in Asia, and largely Chinese, hence the Chinese figures. These were invitations to Ur mystery, these were keyholes. And if you believe as I don't think Nietzsche would have, but as for narrative purposes, I need you all to, that a Facebook profile is a digital husk of a being. And that Facebook then becomes a husk of digital human beings. That a guy who makes $2.7 billion off this mound of husks, violating the privacy of others, or worse, finding psychological errors that they have that will make them self-violate, then flees to Singapore and decides that he doesn't want to be written about, I thought, you know, there are worse ways to spend two weeks. So off I went, deep into the patriarchy. Uh, Singapore has been ruled by a father-son duo since 1963. Um, it is patriarchy par excellence. It, Lee Kuan Yew has been lauded as a great man cursed to a small stage by no greater man than the author of nuclear weapons and foreign policy, Henry Kissinger. Kissinger said that he was a Disraeli trapped in a tropical city-state. <laughs> what an awful fate. <laughs> um, and it's true, it's all true. Lee Kuan Yew took power one night in 1963. He had a lot of friends. His goons went around the island and rounded them up and drove them north across the straits to Malaysia and locked them in jail while he won the election. It was called Operation Cold Store and created uh, the, the longest serving political prisoner, I believe in the 20th century, 23 years. The guy just got out and I think now he's living happily in France. 
Um, this is a virtuosic display of alpha masculinity, if you ask me. And the powers of Lee Kuan Yew Singapore are undeniable and worked upon me from the moment that I got there because the governing systems of Condé Nast would only place me on an outlying island called Sentosa, a jail of a kind for a writer. And every time we tried to ask for something more, it would say, no, Sentosa, Sentosa, Sentosa. So I had no choice but to become a different kind of man. Um, I became a Manhattan stockbroker. I became my brother-in-law, whose name is uh, Reed Howell. And I walked in, because Reed Howell, who uh, was, I think, the New York Athletic Club double squash champion in 2010, uh, had reciprocal privileges with an old British club that had gotten prime city real estate back when the British were running Singapore. And for 200 bucks a night, you could have a room in the middle of the city state with incredible facilities. The British are very, I think we can say cheap. And there was a loss making food and beverage operation. I really felt like I brought a lot to the table. The more I felt like I changed because I, I walked into the club and there was this grand staircase and I felt I, I had, I swaggered like a gunboat off the coast of Panama. I had this awesome Anglo-Americanness about me, which was dwarfed quickly by, by the names of other men. There was a guy named Cocking Stewart, <laughs> who had, in a uh, proud exercise of his gerund, um, had gotten his name posted to the communal bulletin board because he had an outstanding $2,800 bill. Um, and then in maho on mahogany plaques along the wall were uber Anglo alpha names. The names of the British people who've been the president of the club and at the height of Singaporean Anglo society from the 1800s on. And this was the truth of dominance. And like any scientifically provable fact, the dominance would be repeatable. So it would be like, you know, Roderick McMillan, Roderick McMillan, Roderick McMillan, Roderick McMillan. And then like, it would be like Stanley Thornton. And then it would go, Roderick McMillan. And you realize that Roderick McMillan had reclaimed his, his crown. But there's a lacuna. There's a blank spot in the 1940s. There are no names because the Japanese took over Singapore. And their exercise of masculinity, of alpha masculinity, was so brutal as to be unspeakable and unwritable. Uh, they massacred, by some accounts, 10, by some accounts, 20, by some accounts, 50,000 of the native Chinese, saying that the ultimate form of a man was a man who could tell other men that they weren't men, that he could take their lives. Um, and I looked outside, and there was a, a, a beautiful palm tree fringe swimming pool, and you could almost imagine these Japanese officers, you know, these tiny tojos, cannonballing in there after long days of marauding. <laughs> Um, and marauding is what Singapore is still about, uh, and, and treachery. Um, there was a J.P. Morgan private banker, a purported friend of Saverin, who betrayed him to me that very first night. He said he would be, you can't make this stuff up, at a nightclub named for the Ur continent of Pangaea, which exists at the base of the Marina Bay Sands, which was designed by an Israeli architect, uh, Moshe Safdie, to look like a gigantic Noah's Ark. So, and I would later call Safdie, and I said, you know, this seems like a real post-9-11 structure. I mean, because there, there are these infinity pools that make you think that you're about to fall off over the edge. And usually when you interview artists, they're very coy, and he said, uh, he said young man, I wanted to have big circular holes in the top of that thing, and I thought it was too much. But if he'd put them there and you'd jump down through one, you would have crashed into the nightclub Pangea. Now, Singapore is an incredibly sophisticated technocratic state that doesn't believe in free will. The government of Singapore believes that they know what you would want if you knew what you really wanted. And they have redundant built-in feedback loop systems that just make this happen. They map insect populations. Traffic is self-regulating. You get tested in like the fourth grade and handed your own memoir. And the semi-sentient or quasi-sentient or perhaps fully sentient systems of Singapore 
decided that night that um, I would get what I wanted, but what I, maybe in the way that it treats its own islanders, what I didn't know that I wanted, that I would meet a billionaire, but not the end of history data mining billionaire that I saw it, but a more primal billionaire, a coal magnate, um, a member of the Bakri family. The JP Morgan banker said, Sovereign has had a fight with his girlfriend. He's gone home. But I give you the king of Indonesia. And um, mankind has spent 10,000, by and large, shitty years crawling out of the primal pit. This man had grown rich digging such pits in the, in the, in the soil of Java. And I learned, so he was, it was like dress as what you plunder night. He had like a black Gucci shirt, a black Gucci suit, a black ascot. His hair was black and slicked back. His canine tooth was a little funny as if from overuse. <laughs> he loved the movie Gladiator. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, you write for Vanity Fair? What kind of stories you write? Adventure stories? Like an invitation. He was with a Javanese Eve who wore a, uh, a body thong and spoke in fluent tongues of luxury condominium. I think she was trying to sell me something. She was radiant in black light. <laughs> and I'm looking at this guy getting narration from the soulless Morgan banker who says to me, um, they have a mining concession in Java. They were a little too aggressive. They, they hit something down there and there's been a superheated flow of mud and earth that has consumed whole villages and displaced 60,000 people. This was like his resume. <laughs> the, psychopathy had become a luxury good on the island of Singapore. But he wasn't the right kind of maniac. I needed a data miner <laughs> to satisfy the American reader. I mean, the idea of just ruining villages that are anonymous anyway wouldn't play. So I figured I would conserve my energy, and I went home. <laughs> which was a problem, because that was the only chance I was going to have to find the men. Um, when man fully realizes his will, the environment he creates is a lot like pure death. <laughs> and the deep systems of Singapore have a sense of humor, or are evolving towards one, and decided that, as um, Reed Howell, I would wake up every morning to a different movement from Foire's Requiem, <laughs> welcoming me into the afterlife, um, which is bad enough. But one thing that you should not do, if this happens to you, if you fear for the article, if you believe that you ought to have listened to David Kuhn, is you should not go down by the pool of the Tangling Club where the Japanese officers splashed and Google transcendental nihilism. Very, very bad decision. Because you will learn this, that the philosophers of nihilism are very insecure, <laughs> not just because of their depression, but because nihilism has a flaw, which is that it's nothing, and therefore not very useful. To which the transcendental nihilists say, one, uh, the heat death of the planet Earth is a certainty. It will happen. Two, time is an illusion. Ergo three, we're already not here. <laughs> And so they turn a nothing into a something. <laughs> uh, Reed Howell is not a fan of philosophy. This was a little too much for him. Uh, he looked out into the pool, and there was a chlorine mist coming off the water. And there were droves of expatriate housewives doing early morning water calisthenics in unison, counting, groaning counting, treading water, playing on the verge of death. One, two. Three, four, someone would tap out. Five, six, seven. And I thought of the line from Fellini's Amarcord when the old grandfather walks out into the mist-filled morning and he says, seeing nothing in any direction, if this is death, I don't think much of it. <laughs> but it was also very, very frightening, right? Because if we're already dead, then, then what are we? If we're trending towards death, then what choice do we have? Is it fait accompli? I mean, it's, it was a lot for a squash champion to process on a Sunday morning. Um, and then something quite frightening happened, and something that reminded me to the violation of, of the violation of the Westchester pool. Someone had been pooping in the Tangling Club pool. There was a, a panic. 
there were signs everywhere presupposing that the pooper was a toddler, which as, as Winfield showed, already on the verge of his very fragile sanity, I thought was not the case. I thought this was a young a hedge fund Caligula mounting some sort of sly protest against the status quo. Um, and I began looking, scanning the, the lap lanes for turds and contemplating what the turds would be. And on the one hand, they'd be an exercise of free will, positive. On the other hand, they wouldn't be because they'd be fouling the environment. And if the best thing that you can say for yourself is that you poop in a clean pool, then you haven't won anything. They would also be like apertures. Like if you think of the, the blue surface of the water, but then the dark spot of the turd, perhaps through this dark spot, if the transcendental nihilists are right, you could look back in time and see the Japanese guys. <laughs> It was awful, it was a terrible morning. Um, Lucas, who introduced me, had earlier, Lucas and I are in position of a great, um, um, is that the speed up? Oh, he's, Lucas is giving me the speed up. So Lucas had had me interview Don DeLillo and I'd ask him what young novelists should write about and without even thinking, he had said uh, the destruction of the environment as if this was just gonna happen. And I thought, what if we don't even have a choice about it? It was an awful day and it only got worse because that night at the bar, there was a born again Christian Chinese alcoholic who had earlier been reading a children's Bible and after a bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label, he became an atheist. And he said to me, after a day before telling me about Noah, he said, millions and millions of sperm, one egg. And then he started laughing. Like that was the greatest joke in the world. And he said, there's no God. So I had to learn a little bit about free will, and I emailed the two philosophers of free will, Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris. Dennett, who believes in quasi-free will, said he had other stuff to do. Harris, who doesn't believe in free will, said um, for reasons ultimately unknowable to him, he would give me an interview. So I got an interview from this guy by the pool, and it was the last meaningful thing I would do in Singapore. And he said that there is a spot behind the eyes that we think is the eye, that we think is the man, but it's not the man. It's an illusion and it's indefensible. And that in fact, as we speak sentences, we don't even know how they'll end. It was incredibly depressing. And then when things got better, they just got worse because I came back to New York and armed with Harris's insights, I stopped viewing Eduardo Saverin as a human or a man. And I started just viewing him as a system of capital. And that's when I found him. I managed to find out where a lot of his investments were. And finally, he gave us an interview. And he told me that he was excited to be part of the digital future. Because as we move forward, machines would learn ever more about their users and be able to serve them ever better to anticipate our needs and solve our problems for us, making us just happy, listless consumers. <laughs> Transcendental nihilism was very much with me. And I thought about the heat death of the universe Oh, sorry, am I really? Oh, anyway, and I thought that, uh, that this wasn't so bad because even if the worst thing happens, we could look at plumes of pure data and say with confidence, this is not a man. Thank you. Thank you.